Welcome to the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast, a podcast for English teachers in search of creative teaching strategies. I'm Betsy Potash, and I'm glad to welcome you to episode 70, all about helping students leave apathy behind and become more motivated in your classroom. Today, I'm interviewing Dave Stewart Jr., a teacher, dad, husband, and author. He's passionate about helping teachers create an environment where students can find motivation and move in the direction of truly flourishing in their lives. And, very importantly, he's passionate about helping teachers do it in sustainable ways, rather than by sacrificing their entire lives to the profession, Hollywood movie teacher style. He shares some great strategies you can act on immediately in this episode, as well as some big picture ideas for you to ponder. While working on student motivation is not one of those easy small wins you can check off in a day, it's one of the most important things to consider when creating a culture of creativity where students have choice and independence. So let's dive in. Well, welcome to the show, Dave. I'm so delighted to have you on. Thank you so much for having me, Betsy. This is something that I've been looking forward to. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do these days and why you do it? I teach ninth graders in uh, West Michigan, and I do it because I really love love that age group. I love the challenge (laughs) of getting them to to want to learn about things in school. Um, And I also, at, at the same time, write things for teachers and make useful professional learning experiences for teachers. And I do that because I just, um, there's a, there's a strong, I think, sense of mission behind it. Like teachers need, we need all the help we can get. And a lot of the help isn't always helpful. So, um, I want to contribute and because I just find it really engaging and challenging too. Nice. Nice. So you've got, You've got a book out, you've got courses, you've got a blog, and you're teaching 120 students. You're a busy man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, as we're probably going to talk about a little bit, the a big emphasis of my work is about just doing doing all this sustainably. So finding the the high lever points. Yeah. Um, and and emphasizing those in my practice, and really neglecting a lot of the. A lot of the things that used to eat up a lot of my time. Yeah, I love that. And that is, in fact, right where I wanted to start because I love that as you're talking about these things that teachers can do to increase student motivation, which is going to be our main focus today, um, you also talk about the fact that you want your students to flourish as human beings and you want teachers to be able to flourish as human beings. So can we start there with this idea of of flourishing as the goal in the classroom and, and of of a goal of teacher sustainability, because those are two big priorities for you that I just love. Oh yeah, I do too. I mean, it's, it's really fun to get to write about that and study that because it's just win, win, win for everybody. Um, I do think that we all see that when we are experiencing life, um, as in, in our work as something that's engaging, something where it's possible for us to have, um, supportive relationships in our life. There's a sense of meaning, um, success, however we define that. Uh, th- those are some of the elements of flourishing that psychologists link up with this, this idea of flourishing. And, and it, when we have that going on, when teachers have that going on, we tend to do better at promoting that through the work in our classroom for mm. our students. Yeah. And I think really that's the point of schools. Schools exist to promote the long-term flourishing of young people. Why do we want them to learn how to write or to think scientifically or uh, play an instrument or whatever. It's because we think that all these things come together and they increase the odds that you're going to go on and, and flourish. So, um, so, so every single thing that I try to do in my classroom, every single thing that I recommend that other teachers do has to go through this filter of, is this really doable though? You know, because Mm. if I can't do this, for the 120 kids on the roster, then, um, I can't really recommend that other people try to do it because we'll just frustrate ourselves. It might be a great idea in theory, but in practice, it's, it's not actually sustainable. Yeah. 
Okay, so we're going to be focusing in today on one of your big areas of expertise, and that is combating the student apathy. That's such a struggle for a lot of teachers. We all want our students to be really motivated, and that's something that you've considered and researched and and worked on really in depth for many years. So why has this become such a big focus for you in your work? I think the simple answer is because no matter how good our strategies, no matter how amazing the lesson or the unit that you're trying to teach, if kids don't do the work that you need them to do to learn today, and if they don't do that work with care, then the best lesson in the world is going to be minimally effective. Mm. And every teacher teaching right now, I think, experiences the varying shades of apathy that walk into our classroom. It's just a lot of students who they're not necessarily automatically eager to do the work of reading or writing or studying or practicing. And then, you know, we can come up with different ways to try to coerce them to do stuff, right? We can pressure them, uh, reward them, use carrots or sticks or whatever. And you can get, you can like get people to do stuff. You can get students to do stuff through methods like that. But the problem is those things won't make them do it with care. Mm -hmm. It won't make them do it with curiosity or excitement or attention to, oh, where am I struggling right now? And how do I, how do I solve that so that I can keep doing this? You you really can't coerce care out of students. Yeah. And so I, I, I mean, my logic was just, well, let's figure out what what are the, what's underneath the hood of that? What, what is it that makes kids do work and do it with care? Um, and so I just started to research pretty aggressively just in, in my reading of the literature and in my own classroom experimenting to try to figure out like what's, what's kind of a simple big bang for your buck way to do this. Yeah. So let's get into that because I think we're all really excited to hear. (laughs) You write about five big, big sort of pillars, five key beliefs when it comes to helping students be motivated. Um, So this is a huge question for you, but I'm going to throw the ball over to you. Can you walk us through these five big pillars of, of motivation? Yeah. And feel free to, to interrupt me at at any point in this, but I'm going to, I'm going to just go from the uh, what I think is the most powerful belief mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll work my way down Perfect. Um, into the other. So that, so the number one biggest belief beneath motivation in a classroom that I find is the credibility belief. This mm-hmm. is just when a kid thinks that we're good at our job. Okay. Or, um, when, when a teenager in my class says in their, in their heart, Mr. Stewart's a good teacher. This changes everything about that student's experience of my class even if I'm a not that good of a teacher, if a child believes I'm a good teacher, it changes the degree to which they do work and do it with care. And I didn't make this one up. Um, it, it sounds kind of hokey and cheesy and like, <laughs> I don't know, you use the force or something. Uh, but, but this is from John Hattie's crazy meta analysis in the visible learning literature. This is like a top 10 effect size factor in student achievement Hmm. is teacher credibility. And that's why I love this because there's a crazy amount of science behind it. And so the, um, the credibility belief there that that's, that's, that's the top. And we can talk about affecting that a little bit later if you want. Yeah. Um, the next belief is value. And this is just a belief in a student's heart that says this work matters to me. This is going to be useful to me. This is interesting to me. This is cool. There's all different kinds of ways that students arrive at the value belief. Um, and and uh, obviously it's really important because no matter how hard we work on the remaining three beliefs, if a student thinks that the work that we're asking them to do is pointless, mm. these other beliefs aren't going to be that, that impactful. Yeah. So the third belief is belonging, and this has to do with identity and the degree to which a student feels like they fit with us in the classroom. So uh, Seth Godin, he uses a phrase a lot. Seth is a you know 
super popular blogger. I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with his work, but he, he uses this phrase, people like us do work like this hmm. as kind of a phrase to, to unite people and, and to identify community. But, uh, really what he's getting at is the, is the belonging belief, which a lot of the research points to as hugely important when, it, when a young person is sitting here wondering constantly, or Betsy, when you or I are in a setting where we're wondering constantly, do I fit in here? Do other people think I fit in here? Is this like a place where people like me belong? Mm -hmm. When you've got that going on in your brain, you're just using up all of this cognitive potential on that. Your brain doesn't really like stop working on that problem. And so you're just only ever going to be able to put out a, a fixed amount of effort, mm -hmm. a fixed amount of care because there's this part of you that's just nagging about, I don't fit in. And this belief is especially important for students who are underrepresented in our classes. So the, the fourth belief is effort. And this is more popularly called growth mindset. Mm. But growth mindset is just a belief that if, if I do work here, it's going to, it's going to uh, benefit me. I'll, I'll see improvement. That's the effort belief. None of us work hard at something and we feel like no matter what we do, we're not going to get better at it. Um, and the effort belief is, is really, really affected, um, especially in moments of failure, right? Because that's, that's like a key point when the effort belief is either going to be hurt or helped. Mm -hmm. And then the final belief is the efficacy belief, which is just the belief that I will succeed at this. So if we give a student an assignment, and, and make no mistake, these beliefs fluctuate based on the day, based on the assignment, based on is that kid across the room here or not. Researchers find that they shift based on, you know, if you're in your first hour class with Mr. So-and-so or in your second hour class with Miss, you know, so-and-so, uh, they're, they're hugely malleable, hugely con context dependent. Um, but th the efficacy belief is just, I can succeed at this. And, and so this is built on experiences of past success. Mm -hmm. So those just to, just to sum it up, credibility, value, belonging, effort, and efficacy. Those are the five key beliefs. I like how they're all, they all feel approachable to me. Like I can just mm -hmm. start brainstorming a list of how I would want to try to support each of these pillars in the classroom. Yes. Um, yes. But because we probably can't do that with each of them right now because our show would be three or four hours long. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> Let, right. Let's just look at a few concrete steps. If you're trying to help a teacher who, who had bought into these five ideas, which makes so much sense and, as you say, are based on so much research, what are some initial steps um, that teachers could try out to help create this culture of improved motivation? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the amazing thing is that all of us are working on these, right? Right. Uh, just we're just intuitively trying to, like, I'm, I'm, I think many of your listeners are, they're trying to create students who think of themselves as, you know, writers, Yeah. for example, yeah. fair, fair to say. Absolutely. So that's, that's, that's just, that's just trying to improve the belonging belief in our students. Hmm. Um, so, so that, that's the first thing I would say is just use these as a grid for analyzing and organizing what you already do, because you already probably have some best practices that, you know, like you do them every single year or every single semester. Why? Because you know that they work. So that's the first step. The first step is just use this grid to analyze what you're already doing, because it just starts to make the problem of apathy seem more solvable, yeah. I think, when we, when we use these five key beliefs to analyze it. Um, one super high leverage strategy that I recommend is called moments of genuine connection. And all that you do is you take every kid that you're responsible to teach this, this semester or whatever and try to get their names on one sheet of paper. And you just have a clipboard where it's just for this, this list of all the kids that you teach. And you just simply try to create a moment of genuine connection with every kid on that list as, as soon as you can. And a moment of genuine connection is just a, it's 30 seconds to three minutes long where you're just indicating to a student um, implicit messages like, I see you, 
I, I know you, I respect you, I value you. I think that you're fun. It's just those little small moments of human connection that honestly make teaching the amazing thing that it is, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, those small little moments that honestly can take a really terrible week even in the classroom. And if I all of a sudden have one of these, it's like, holy cow, it just kind of like reinvigorates me. Hmm. But what you're trying to do with that list is just to systematically force yourself to try to create these more and more and more and more and more. Well, what's happening? What's happening when we do this with the five key beliefs? Well, first of all, we're affecting our credibility with every child that we connect with. Every child who has a sense of, wow, Mr. Stewart, really? You like, no, no, no. You know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm like seen by him as a, as a full human. If I can give Dennis that impression today, just through a small moment of connection over maybe a, a movie that we both saw last weekend or something, um, I'm affecting credibility because part of credibility, the research says, is, is this sense that students have that we care. Okay. Mm-hmm. We care about them. Um, and The care component of credibility, it kind of has two prongs, two important prongs. They need a sense that we care about them as a person, as just an individual human being. And then they also need a sense that we care about them as a student. So for a lot of your listeners, as a writer, like, dude, dude, how do you communicate to kids? Like, you actually care that this individual child improves as a writer this year. Moments of genuine connection are... They, they play around with that. And if you Google that, that phrase, moments of genuine connection, you'll see some examples on my website of specific, specific instances in my class that I would characterize as, as that. Nice. So you're affecting credibility when you do this. You're also affecting the belonging belief when you do this. And, um, you're also affecting like your motivation when you do this, you're, you're affecting your sense of the work of teaching being valuable because you're, you're kind of coming back to probably one of the loves that brought you to teaching to begin with. And that is students. <laughs> yes. So I would, I would, I would commend this to your readers immediately. It'll cost you one sheet of paper with some names copied and pasted on it. And, um, and by tracking it, by putting it on a clipboard, that's kind of like out on your desk. What all you're doing is you're just making it so that you kind of can't forget about it. It can't fall by the wayside. And, uh, I really want to, I want, to, I want to reinforce the idea that these are quick. Yeah. We're not, we're not giving up three hours after school um, to have a big, long conversation session with a couple of students. I used to, I used to do that. I used to be proud of doing that. Um, maybe, maybe once or twice a year, I'll, I'll have some type of extended conversation with a couple of students. But, but now I, I, I really try to not do that, mostly because I want to, get all my work done at work so that I can go home and enjoy my family and be a good husband and, 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 uh, and dad, you know, so, so, so these can be very efficient. I just, people miss that sometimes they think they gotta, they gotta be constantly accessible in order to connect well with students. And, And I'm really not constantly accessible, but I think a lot of my students would say, man, that guy really cares about us. And it's because of moments of genuine connection. So that, that would be, that would be a second thing besides just celebrating what you already do would be using the moments of genuine connection strategy. I like it. I like it. And I like the way you advise that it not become your whole life. (laughs) It's such an easy trap to fall into. Oh yeah. Because, because you feel like you're saving the world, you know, when, when you're the teacher whose door is always open. But okay, when when are we going to give feet on writing? When are we going to plan tomorrow's lesson? When are we gonna, you know? Yeah, like, <laughs> there's a lot so, of priorities to cover. And and oftentimes that's the stuff that we take home with us. And now all of a sudden, teaching becomes this really heavy burden because we have to be constantly doing it. And I don't I don't think that we have to be. And I think that honestly, for the sake of our flourishing, we can't let teaching become our entire life. Yeah. Agreed. Definitely. So, so organize your teaching into this kind of grid, like think about the ways you're approaching these and ways you might want to approach them. Um, now that you're thinking about them explicitly and then have these moments of genuine connection. Yeah. 
Did you have another specific that you wanted to share there? I think one one thing maybe would be to. Well, no, I'm I'm going to say this one. I was going to say, look at your grading policies, because policies have a huge effect on motivation. But not all teachers have impact on that. So, um, so let me give you something that we all can do. We all can lead our students in a simple exercise that was created by a researcher named Chris Holloman out of the University of Virginia. And all that you do is you have students brainstorm things that they care about in their life, things that they value in their life, and then brainstorm the topics, assignments, concepts that you've been studying in your class for the last month or so. And you you have them draw lines between the two lists. Hmm. Uh, connections between things that they care about, things that they value, things they want to do in their life, and things that they learned last month. And then you have the students write about one of the connections. Oh, that's cool. And you have them share with a partner, and then you have them refine. If they find that they can make their connection even better, you have them do that. And this is, this is, this is a, I mean, you, you can find quote-unquote worksheets that guide you through this online, but... Mm-hmm. And, and Chris Holloman made those, but he's very forceful about the idea. This is an interactive exercise that you're doing with students, 10, maybe 15 minutes long once a month. And what he finds is that in the, in the studies that he's done where students do this simple, simple exercise, uh, the students who came into the class expecting to do really poorly, uh, the students who came into the class really not valuing that course material, mm-hmm. they tend to have significant jumps in their achievement in that class. They're likely to take similar classes in the future. So it's one of those really powerful, like small touch, yeah. but very, very intentionally designed interventions that is pulled straight from the, the psychology research. Oh, very cool. So let's let's segue out of these kind of big picture things that we can all do with mm-hmm. all classes, basically, and talk about a few of the specific scenarios that can be really frustrating for teachers when it comes to motivation. So you write about three scenarios in your book that I think we can all recognize in the classroom. There's there's the student you're trying to reach who's just so focused on their grades. They're always asking, you know, why did I lose this point? What can I do to get extra credit, why do I only have a 99 (laughs) or whatever. Um, There's the kid who comes across as just not caring at all for whatever myriad of reasons of things that might be going on in their life. And then the kid who, who perhaps because of what they've been through up until that point just hates doing schoolwork. And so can we talk about sort of some strategies with these types of students? Sure. Yeah. First, first, your credibility in all three of these scenarios is a as overpowered like sword against these dragons of apathy. When a child is spoken to by a teacher who they view as good at their job, mm-hmm. who cares about them, who who knows what they're doing, who's passionate, then then all the messages that I'm going to talk about right now are just like. I don't know, a hundred times more powerful. Okay. (laughs) So if there's anything that you take from this podcast, it's, uh, do some reading right now on credibility, like stop the podcast, just Google teacher credibility and just, and just read up on it. Hmm. I've got a lot of articles on my blog and, and like, this is one where if you can master thinking about this, implement some straight about this and all these things we're about to talk about are going to be way easier. Hmm. Okay. So, so with grades, this is where focusing on long-term flourishing is exceptionally helpful. I teach this to my students in any way that I can, that I care about their success long term, that I'm hoping to run into them in the grocery store in town in 20 years and see them living a life where uh, they're flourishing. Uh, so the the thing is that grades are, it's like, what I, what I tell my students, cause I teach a couple of AP classes. And so these kids tend to be pretty grade focused. Yeah. And I tell them our goal is just to master the material. If you master the material, if you just apprentice yourself to the discipline 
of studying world history, then, and, and, and basically if you do what I tell you to do as a teacher, right? Like if I, if I, if I give you this study strategy, like go try that. If I, um, you know, ask you to read this article, like do that. If you, if you do the work that I set up for you to do, that I encourage you to do, teach you to do and aim at mastering this stuff, just knowing as well as you can, then the grade will follow. The grade is going to, it's, it's going to come. Okay. <laughs> so some of this, I just know from, from now teaching for 13 years that, 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 that is how it works. If a kid masters the material in my class, the, the grade is going to come. So, so that, that's like a key message for my grade focused students. Yeah. Uh, sometimes if I have parents who are really anxious about this, I will, um, just lovingly share with them. And I really do try to approach parents with love because as a parent myself, like I, I know the heartache, I know the <laughs> agony and, and you know, it, it, I, I get it. Me too. Um, yeah. Right. Like you, you, you get that. And so that, that just helps a lot to disarm parents sometimes to, to be feel like they're being spoken to somebody who like empathizes with their pain. Mm-hmm. Just tell them like, listen, the, Life for your child is not going to be made or broken by and by and grade. What we want to figure out is how to help them to, to learn as effectively as possible and not fixate on, you know, is it, is it 95%, 94%. Um, and, and honestly, Betsy, one more thing I would say is I just don't die on the hill of grading, you know? Yeah. So I, this is not like a, an area of, of, critical importance to me where if a parent comes to me with a concern where I'm not going to just listen to them and say, okay, yeah, let, let me relook at that, at that assignment. And, um, I'll see if there's something to what you're saying, like some concern with the grading. I just, I just really don't have that. And I feel like a lot of my colleagues, this, this gene that I don't have, where like, no, you gotta, you gotta like always just, just like push away these concerns about grades. But I, I just kind of say, no, bring them to me. We'll, we'll look at it. We'll, we'll figure it out. Maybe I was wrong and maybe not. And look, I just want you to understand how this happened and that that'll kind of diffuse. A lot of this grade obsession comes from, comes from home. Yeah. Um, or it comes from students who are struggling with perfectionism. And so I identifying where the grade focus is coming from is good too. But, but I think what your readers probably recognize, but, bears repeating is just that great obsession is a motivation problem that is a motivated student because they're doing the work but they're not really doing it with care they're just doing it so that they they can get the grade so we we do want to um discourage great obsession yeah and and yeah so so we just continue to fight that fight (laughs) Um, the, the kid who comes across as not caring is totally apathetic. The, um, I forget, this is something that Angela Watson writes about, but I learned about this from some teacher that I ran into in Illinois and it's called two by 10, I think. Okay. Hey, have you heard about this, Betsy? I don't think Maybe. so. It's basically, if take, take like the most checked out kid in your class. If you've got that kid who just refuses to do anything. Okay. And I, I, I tried this with a couple of students this year. Um, and just for two minutes a day, for 10, 10 school days straight, you talk to them about whatever they want to talk about, but it just can't be related to school. Hmm. Okay. So it's kind of a moment to genuine connection on steroids a little bit because you're, you're trying to have that moment every single day, 10 days straight, and you're not touching school at all. And I think that the reason that, I mean, if, and if you Google blog articles about two by 10 and read the comment sections, you're just going to find like all these gushing testimonials because <laughs> teachers are just like this, this changed my whole relationship with this student. This like saved my school year. I was so frustrated. Now I love this student. They, they come to me with, you know, more stuff than I even want them, want them. That's so awesome. Oh yeah. And it's so simple, but, but what's happening is you're, you're, you're kind of that, that student who appears to not care at all typically has this whole history of like, you know, school is pointless. Nobody cares about me, but I don't belong here. They just got these really kind of hard crusted anti beliefs. Yeah. F- and you're just like kind of breaking that up. You're, you're breaking the pattern. 
And so all of a sudden it breaks through the static oh, in that student's heart. And that's so lovely. <laughs> it's so doable. Yeah, right. Right. It's another one of those really low touch, high leverage strategies. Yeah. Um, so, so that's like, that's, that's the thing to try with, with our most apathetic students. And okay. usually what we're going to discover there is, holy cow, um, this student is, is working at a great disadvantage, right? I mean, at, at one point this year, I've, through doing this, learned that one of my students has a, had, had like an exposed, exposed tooth or something. Oh. It's like was waiting to get a dentist appointment. Jeez. I wonder this this guy's checked out of school. I mean, I would be curled up in a fetal position in the corner. Yeah. Wow. So that just, you know, that, that starts to just change the equation. And obviously then you try to <laughs> connect the student with some resources so that they can get that much, much more urgent need taken care of. Of course. Um, and then, and then for this kid who hates doing schoolwork, there's, this is where moments of genuine connection help us because we need to dig deeper there. There's a million reasons to hate schoolwork, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, it could be my video games at home are way more exciting. It could be I've I've got an overbearing you know dad who's like really mean about my grades. It could be it could be just all these things. I had some really terrible teachers last year. Um, I'm I'm suffering with some severe mental health challenges. So, so first we need to try to discern a little bit more what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Um, and use, using the beliefs is helpful here too, because is it the, that the child hates writing? Okay. So now we need to figure out is, is this because writing is pointless? All right. That's, that's a value belief problem. Is this because no matter what I do, I never succeed at writing. I always get the worst grade that I can get on writing I have my whole life. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's efficacy. efficacy. That's effort, right? This child doesn't believe that they're going to succeed no matter what. And they don't think that their effort's going to pay off. So why give it? Well, what this starts to do is it identifies our next steps because now we're going to try to affect those beliefs. And this is written about extensively in, uh, in my book and on my blog like how to impact these individual beliefs. Yeah. But, but that's like the key thing that we need to figure out is why do they hate the schoolwork and what beliefs specifically can we target to try to change that in our class? Because the research is really clear that these beliefs are really malleable at the classroom level. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, we may not be able to change them forever. Uh, that's, that's, that's a big ask that takes like, I think, millions of belief supporting moments throughout someone's life for them to just have like a durable effort belief. Yeah. And even then it'll change. Like if you tell me, Dave, if you just put in the effort in, uh, I don't know, weightlifting or something, you'll, you'll see a benefit. Um, well, like everything in me is just like not appealed by that at all. <laughs> right. And honestly, it probably starts with the value belief. I just don't really value that. So, so, and, and I'm like a pretty motivated person, but put me in a different context and, and that'll change. So my point is just, we have great reason to hope, great, great evidence to trust that if we work hard at these beliefs in our setting, we can implement these things in our setting. And then we can just kind of let, let next year worry about itself for right now. Let's just try to create a great motivating experience this year. Okay, so I I love what you said, Dave. I feel confident as I think about these five beliefs and as I think about some of the things that you're saying that it's really doable to start to approach these issues of motivation um, with these specifics and then and then to have these big pillars in mind, I feel like could really be quite um, inspiring throughout the year. But I also, I want to circle back here at the end of our interview to what you've said about sustainability and long-term flourishing. And I feel like a trap that teachers could fall into here is this age-old problem of teachers, of just putting everything into it and, you know, making that 2 by 10 happen with 20 different students in the same 
10 days and, you know, just working yeah. themselves into the ground. Let's talk a little bit about the traps that teachers need to avoid when they start really turning their attention toward motivation. Uh, well, what I think that the, 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 the big trap to fall into is just allowing this to be the next thing that you spend way too many hours on. And the only way to solve working too many hours at teaching is to just create some simple rules for yourself. I can remember, I can remember like I was, I was a couple years into teaching and I was talking to my soon to be wife and I was telling her about how I worked so much. Like I was all proud. That, <laughs> and I think the Such line a was, common thing. Oh yeah. Like the only time I see the sunlight is through the windows of my classroom. That might've been the line <laughs> to which she re- responded. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> something like that. Just totally point blank. And I like your wife. <laughs> Oh yeah. Right. I mean, I had to marry her at that point. (laughs) So she, she explained, listen, you don't even know if what you're doing matters. If you're working unlimited hours, you have no way to measure if you're doing the most important stuff, right? You might be spending all these hours just doing a decoration in your class. Well, is that really the best use of your time? And so she just said, you got to have some rules. You got to, you got to set a quitting time every day. And when that quitting time comes, you, you leave. Stop working on teaching. And if that means that tomorrow you're going to walk into a mess, well, then tomorrow you're going to learn a lesson about time management. <laughs> because you are experiencing the pain of poorly allocating your time. Hmm. And that has been like my training ground for figuring out how to find efficient ways to impact student motivation. Because if you start Googling this, if you start if you start just looking anywhere for this, you'll find the whole gamut from really efficient to really, really, you know, like like the Hollywood teacher movies. Right. And I and I love the the movie Freedom Riders because they they show the character losing her marriage. Yeah. She motivates these kids crazy. Really, really successful in the classroom. But she sacrifices her whole life. And, uh, you know, to the teachers who feel led to do that, I guess that's, that's your thing. But I, I feel a strong sense of loyalty to my, to my wife and family. I'm the only husband I hope my wife will ever have. The only father that my children will ever have or have, or they, they deserve me in a high quality way. And I'm a better teacher when I make sure that I stop at a certain time. So, so they, they I think the listeners have to make sure that there's some boundaries and this is going to make you more efficient at giving feedback on writing. This is going to make you more efficient at, um, deciding whether or not to have a long conversation with a colleague. It's just going to produce a lot of wisdom gains for you that having no limits on your time just won't do. You just won't have to get, wise about the most efficient ways to use your time, the most effective ways to use your time, because you're giving yourself unlimited time. So I think that would help a lot for the teachers who are going to struggle with this. And, um, I just keep them pointing in the direction of simple, efficient means to improve motivation. Yeah. I really feel like the message you're giving there is, is right up there with, with the actual content of our interview today about student motivation. It's just been something I've been so interested in lately. I feel like I've been learning so much because my first years of teaching were just like yours, where I was spending Mm -hmm. 18 or 19 hours a day working and I, I felt really proud of it. And then at the end of the year, you know, I almost left teaching. And so I just think, you know, as we work on these huge questions, like confronting student apathy, um, we just have to keep in mind our own our own health and our own happiness and our ability to continue to do the job. Yeah. yeah. So so anyway, well, thank you so much for coming on with all this great information and a and a great philosophy to go with it. When my listeners want to go and and read more and connect with you more, um, where can they find you? The best spot's going to be DaveStewartJr.com. That's right. Dave. S T U A R T J R dot com. And um, because there you can find a lot of blog posts I've written yes. on a lot of these things that we talked about. So that's a great spot. And then the most organized, comprehensive place I've written about this is in chapter two 
of these six things, my book, these six things, because that, that chapter is just about the five key beliefs. And that book also has some advice on how to think about writing, um, and, uh, and some tips on better saying or grading practices and stuff that we didn't get into, but will, will be very helpful maybe to a lot of your listeners. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you again so much, Dave. Betsy, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for what you're doing here on the podcast. This is exactly what I think teachers like me need. So I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to check out the full blog post for this episode, just head to www.nowsparkcreativity.com and click on the podcast tab at the top of the page. If you'd like to continue the conversation, leave a comment on the show notes, email me at betsy at nowsparkcreativity.com or hop into my Facebook group, Creative High School English, and make a post. The Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network, podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. For more podcast recommendations, visit edupodcastnetwork.com.